And welcome to the conversation live from the DK Vine Party House in Los Angeles. I'm Heil Russell. And I'm Cameron Regal. And we are here in LA in the aforementioned Party House. And, uh, you know, I'm really excited right now, honestly, because uh, for the trip, I bought a new toothbrush and it's an Oral B uh, toothbrush and it's. It's just a regular toothbrush, but it's got a battery inside that uh, that vibrates at like an electric toothbrush. So you get all of the benefits of an electric toothbrush, but it allows the the ease and comfort of just a traditional uh, small uh, disposable toothbrush device. Party house! Woo! So yeah, uh, we are here. Uh, E3 hasn't even technically begun yet. It won't begin till tomorrow. Our internal clocks are all screwed up, not just because we are now three hours off from uh, Eastern uh, sa- Savings Time, is it, Eastern Daylight Time. That's what we're. Say, uh, I just usually say Eastern Time. Uh, make it simple. Yeah, we're, we're we're three hours off from uh, Eastern time, which is the correct time. Check the Bible. But uh, not only that, but Microsoft decided to just throw tradition to the wind and have their uh, media briefing on Sunday afternoon slash evening uh, this year, as opposed to the usual Monday. So it's Monday now, and we're just, uh, we're all confused like a Grant Kirkhope voice gorilla. Yeah, this has been something that's kind of been hard to keep track of with E3 in general. I mean, at, this is the crazy thing. At this point, E3 has still not, has not officially started, even though we are, what, four conferences deep at this point, and have, like, several others before the official start up on Tuesday. To be fair, I mean, really the big three are all that matters, even though Nintendo doesn't really have conferences anymore. I don't really count all of these other ones like Bethesda and uh, Ubisoft. And I mean, it's cute that they want to have little conferences for uh, of their own, but let's be real here. <laughs> they don't need their own conferences. That would be like if, well, okay, maybe it wouldn't be like I, it, delusions of grandeur, but I was going to say it would be like if DK Vine decided to have their own conference. And you know what? That's a great idea, and I might do it next year. But uh, we would just be on the street corner. <laughs> DK Vine, E3, media briefing, and uh, homeless people would piss on us. And uh, that would be fine. That would be fine. Uh, now that I've got live streaming figured out in Los Angeles, we could do that. Um, anyway, so... Brief episode, uh, because we got to get into the E3 shenanigans. We are going to the uh, Xbox Media Showcase Party uh, in just a few hours. So we've got to get this episode out the door. We did not actually attend the media briefing this year. Uh, Nobody uh, in the rare uh, fan community got in, save save for the people who got in through the fan fest. and MF Wolf, who bribed an Australian guy. I, I don't really know what Mitchell did there, but um, yeah, he, he got in somehow. I think he sold somebody drugs, quite honestly. I, I just assume it involves a contract written in blood somehow. I don't even know whose blood. Probably a beloved Burger King uh, Kids Club member, Wheels, so named because of his paralysis. Uh, so yeah, we did not get in and it, it was kind of, uh, we, we thought we were going to get in up until a couple, uh, just like two days beforehand. Uh, but it's, it's cool. I mean, it's, it's, it's not like a big deal because quite honestly, we got to still watch it from the party house. We got to, uh, have a video call with the DK Vine inner circle, $25 a month on dkvine.com slash Patreon. And, um, that was really fun. It was really fun to hang out with uh, Mamechi, beloved uh, conversation caller Mamechi, 
And uh, we, we had to talk with the, I, I believe, Scraps came in. Uh, Josh Wallen from the Geek Critique was there. Of course, uh, DK Vine, former staffer and current DK Vinecraft administrator, Jeff Onan. I'm sure I'm forgetting others uh, who, who are there. But uh, it, it was fun to have that shared community event and actually watch it from the comfort of uh, a couch versus the, the cold, unforgiving uh nature of the galen center um I, I did miss seeing phil spencer live though because he is such a cool dude and i want to be him when i grow up um see i i don't think i could pull off that jacket t-shirt jeans combination that he can so effortlessly but um yeah big no no big deal because we're getting into everything else and that will start in just a couple hours i'm looking at my watch but as Cameron can attest i don't have a watch so why am i looking at my wrist i don't know all right well we we've got to talk about microsoft's reveals and uh we can also fill you in on some of the little details from our trip we i don't think we're fully caught up on our sleep we got in uh it was saturday night uh, our plans landed around between like 9 and 9.30 p.m. Pacific time. And then by the time I got my luggage, which was the last piece of luggage off the carousel, and then I had to uh, huff it from Terminal 4 to Terminal 1 where Cameron landed. And then we had to get our rent-a-car shuttle and uh, go to Enterprise Rent-a-Car and uh, the lovely people at Enterprise Rent-A-Car, thank you for uh, supporting DK Vine by actually renting us a car. And uh, we got a rent-a-car. By the time we got to the party house, found the party house, it was already midnight. And it, I had to, I kicked Cameron off out of the car onto a dodgy Los Angeles street because we could not find the party house. And I was like, Cameron, you're going to have to get out. And like he was like, but this is gang territory, and I'm wearing I'm wearing I'm wearing blue, and this is uh this is the Bloods territory. And I was like, Cameron, get the fuck out of the car. And uh, only a sliver of that is true. He did make me get out of the car. And for all we know, it it might be Bloods territory. We do not know which gang territory we're in right now. Which. I just realized I, I'm wearing a red shirt right now. Cameron's wearing a blue shirt. So we're hedging our bets. One of us will survive the massacre. Yeah, yeah. Um, we, we are ill-equipped to walk into a Team Fortress match. I'm actually going to put on a, a green uh, button-up shirt uh, just to be safe. Just just <laughs> uh, fall somewhere in the middle here. Um, but, uh, yeah, we, we found the party house. We figured out the parking situation, which is pretty nice for L.A. As, uh, <laughs> there's far more convoluted setups as far as parking goes. We got into the party house, and then we spent a couple hours. Uh, well, I spent a couple hours trying to set up my new laptop because uh, I, I was bringing two computers with me. And the laptop that I had, my old laptop that I had, all of my uh, programs for streaming, recording, uh, just Photoshop, everything. Uh, the outer case cracked when I was packing it um, to leave, and the screen, uh, the the actual monitor started to fall apart, which rendered the laptop basically unusable were I to actually try to pack it. So I had to reinstall everything. Just got done with that right before we started this live stream. So that was a two-day process. So, yeah, it, it was exhausting. And then uh, we woke up. Um, I, we had to do DK Vine work. You know, um, a lot of unglamorous stories I'm sharing right now, which I'm sure is what you want to hear about when it comes to E3. But suffice to say, we finally settled in for the Microsoft briefing and uh, that's what we'll talk about. Um, sea of Thieves kind of fell right into the middle of it, I, I would say, which is unfortunate for me because as much as I'm like eagerly waiting, I'm like, this isn't Sea of Thieves, I don't care. This isn't Sea of Thieves, I don't care. Once we get to Sea of Thieves, it's like, and I pardon, pardon the crude imagery, but it's like an orgasm. You're done after that, and it's hard to really focus. You just kind of want to fall asleep after you get what you came for. So I, I was like super uh, into the conference up until Sea of Thieves, and then I metaphorically blew my wad, and uh, I, I don't really remember what happened after that. See, I was kind of uh, the opposite. I mean, yes, I did come exclusively 
pretty much for Sea of Thieves and anything else I happen to see and like is just a small bonus. But uh, I did kind of appreciate it being in the middle simply because as we were watching this off-site, we did have, and with the Inner Circle in tow, there was some issues with uh, keeping up with all of our video streaming and waiting for things to buffer. And the entire time I'm thinking to myself, oh God, the stream is going to crap out right as we get to Sea of Thieves. We're going to miss the thing. So in that regard, uh, thank you to the various uh, shooty, drivey, blood, head, rippy games that came before and that I unfortunately missed um, trying to sort out our technical issues. You know, as much as my opinion of Microsoft has shifted in just these last few years, um, and I'm like just genuinely a fan of Microsoft Studios and everything Phil Spencer has kind of shepherded in after he took over. Uh, there, There is still kind of the uh, stereotype of the Xbox game that isn't really dispelled in a lot of these <laughs> media briefings because you do have a lot of like notoriously like grim post-apocalyptic games with just overly melodramatic violence and cheap attempts at pathos. Yeah, um, we, we did not get a bloodstained controller this year. Um, <laughs> uh-huh. In all of the... that That is not an, an Xbox One X uh, feature, fortunately. Uh, yeah, it, it, uh, Cameron, you, you commented yesterday, it's funny how, with the exception of, like, Rare, the most colorful games were all the, the quick indie studios sizzle reel, which, like, everything, all, all of the AAA, like, first party titles were all just trying to, uh, to fill that niche of what you expect from an Xbox game, and it's, it's basically, you know, you, you invest so much money in it, you kind of have to play it safe, and uh, the, the indie titles are the ones that can take risk and harken back to a more colorful, more optimistic time when it came to what people expect from video games. And in these pessimistic days, I need an escape. I don't want to be playing post-apocalyptic games when I, I don't really have faith in our own civilization at the moment. I, I need escapism. I need to hope for a better tomorrow. So, or in the, in the case of Sea of Thieves, a better uh, 1600s. But uh, it, it, it kind of becomes just a, a nice laugh when you see like a, a zombie ripping a dude in half and entrails flying everywhere. You're just like, oh, Xbox. I, I think if we made a drinking game out of uh, body parts being torn from other body parts, uh, we'd have died of alcohol poisoning. I mean, I I do understand uh, th- these are perfectly valid ex- expressions here, um, but uh, it it's not in my wheelhouse of interest, so I it does kind of fade for me with some of these games. And it, to be fair, not all of the colorful games were in the Sozo wheel. There were a few. Um, Cuphead made a return, showing again. I has it been a, a, as many E threes as Sea of Thieves now? Yeah, and I, because uh, um, I was out here first time E3 2015, and we had no idea what Rare was showing off. We just knew something, like Rare was having a big rebranding, and they were going to be showing off something massive. So that's why we were out here. And uh, so I was far more cynical about, like, Microsoft at the time. I was, I was just there for Rare, you know. Uh, I, I don't have time for all of this uh, tomfoolery. Uh, and uh, Cuphead really took me by surprise. I was like, "Well, that looks cool." Like that—that that was that was the first thing to actually shake me out of my um, shitty buyout era mentality. And but before like Craig Duncan even like came out in his uh, kicking uh, sneakers and uh, and uh, issued in the the official start of the Rare Renaissance. But uh, yeah, Cuphead's actually got a release date now for September, I believe. September twenty ninth, I believe. Yeah, so uh, I will actually be picking up Cuphead because I, I am looking forward to that. And that's us- that's not even like the kind of aesthetic I usually go for, like the, the old Steamboat Willie kind of uh, classic animation. That's not my thing, uh, quite honestly. But I admire the the presentation and just the 
the moxie of it that um it, it's enough to win me over i i can res- if i respect something enough i want to check it out it's like the reason i fall into wikipedia wormholes but in this case i i might actually want to uh to buy cuphead um but uh i i guess we should talk about sea of thieves so um we actually haven't rewatched the trailer in full since uh it was like what 19 minutes it was actually about a little over nine, and uh, oh, okay. if we were smart, we would have replayed it right before streaming this episode, but uh, I think the technical difficulties kind of uh, shifted our priorities a little bit, and uh, uh, whoops, uh, this this is your live experience, uh, people. <laughs> As I uh, told Cameron ahead of time before coming out, when you're out at E3, it is so hard to keep up with E3, because it is... Uh, and Cameron brought up a great um, like analogy is that when you're – well, I'll let him say that because he's sitting right next to me. I would say so far the difference between like experiencing E3 at home and experiencing it here is if you take the time in the day to keep up with E3, everything is at your fingertips. You can You have all this information instantly available, and it kind of can overload you. Here it's kind of like uh, – Imagine if for every hyperlink you clicked, you had to physically navigate to a space to take in that info. Yeah, basically, this is this is like if the internet were an actual place, and it's it's kind of a nightmare. It's it's brilliant and cool and awesome to be out here, and it's just a one of a kind experience. But part of me also wishes I could split in two and have the E3 experience of my childhood where it's just coming to my computer and I get giddy and I can take a break during the day and go for a hike in the mountains. Uh, <laughs> but... On the flip side of the internet in person angle, you do get stuff like having a dinner conversation about the geography of the Northern Hemisphere. Right. Which is why I started drinking, Cameron, because... I don't necessarily agree with the DKC3 instruction manual, but I will uh, make allowances for the sake of your map. Um, <laughs> so, uh, yeah. So, anyway, the uh, see, I thought it was 19 minutes because time literally slows down whenever, like, a, a DKU-centric trailer appears. Uh, Rare-centric or, you know, maybe tomorrow, it, depending on what we get with Nintendo uh, Super Mario Odyssey or Diddy Kong Racing? No, no, no. Just joke, joking, joking. Uh, but yeah, it, it it felt super long because it was the longest in the history of E3. This was the longest rare slash DKU related trailer we've ever had. Nine minutes, na- fully narrated. We we I thought it was John McFarlane, the um the the rare employee who like appears on a lot of videos has a scottish action it was actually john mcmurtry who was doing the narration a lot of people are confused so i wasn't the only one so i don't have to turn in my uh fake paid actor credentials yeah uh, stellar work john that that was an incredible voiceover for that trailer and uh i think another reason we kind of have uh an ill idea of the time scale is it was a very different sort of I don't know if, what what to say, like, tone compared to everything that came before. Like, even as we were talking about the sort of, again, uh, stereotypical Xbox games, I apologize, I can't find a better phrasing. Um, there was, For a very combat-focused game, this was very... The, the trailer wasn't, like, full of quick action cuts. It wasn't a lot of... It wasn't cut together like a movie trailer, I would say. It was trying to kind of be an immersive experience within a trailer. And I thought that was really a cool way to do this. It didn't have some sort of melodramatic, tonally off, like, song full of sorrow sung by a female vocalist as, like, characters, like, look out on the horizon wistfully um, trying to elicit a cheap response from the audience that just comes off as hackneyed and cliched at this point. No, this was fun. It was goofy. Um, it, it was essentially the rare spirit. It, it was it was humorous, self deprecating at times, um, and uh, it, it was it was very much a good way to illustrate. Hey, this game is still quintessentially rare. For all of you people who have been on the fence for two years now, 
uh, this is what we get. And of course, people, this is still a game you have to play. And I think um, we can talk a little bit about more about Sea of Thieves now, which will be fun. Um, a lot of things um, were officially revealed to the general public with this trailer. And this is a new build of the game, uh, m- a more advanced than where the technical alpha last let off. The, the last update in the technical alpha kind of was kind of a middle ground between the, an older older build and this E3 build. They started to have elements in there that were like leaning towards the E3 build, but uh, there's a lot of context that we finally saw here. And um, uh, I, I, mean, I don't know where to begin. Weather effects, um, we, we finally saw a storm, and uh, it hinted in the narration that storms might even damage your ship if it's strong enough. And uh, something I noticed that we haven't really seen in trailers so far or publicly revealed, uh, or rather, I suppose, heard was, and granted, I don't know how much of this was just editing, but we got to hear a little bit of Robin's, like the dynamic music we heard about. And uh, my God, I'm I'm not saying anything new here. Robin's doing a phenomenal job. So uh, we are live streaming this right now, the first ever live stream we've done in Los Angeles. And uh, we've got our chat going in, in Twitch. And uh, Karate Joe wants to know, uh, can you eat bananas stem first in the alpha build? Uh, the- well, can we say that? I mean, we uh, can say that uh, I believe uh, Mike Chapman has said on an E3 live stream that you'll be able to play this E3 build. This so, this this is the alpha build essentially now. So, so therefore, yes, I would assume when this build goes public, you will be able to gorge yourselves on these uh, completely unpeeled bananas. Yeah, that it's kind of become. I I don't know how much has become a meme. I guess I, I remember for a brief like twelve hour period, my exasperated expressions of getting bombarded by cannonballs became a brief meme. And then it faded into either, thankfully. Um, so I don't know how much of a meme this uh, eating a banana, f- basically uh, performing fellatio on, on a banana peel first uh, w- without unpeeling it, you know, putting the, the stem in your mouth or whatever. I, I don't know how much of actual meme that is, but people are having fun with it. And yeah, yeah, that that's the way it looks. Speaking of memes, I'm seeing a lot more people... Uh look at the water this time and uh, rightfully so i'm kind of like the water in sea of thieves has looked good ever since we first saw a glimpse of it in the original trailer and they keep finding ways to make it look more impressive and like you you just set the bar for them like okay this looks amazing they can't possibly get any better than this and then as soon as the trailer loaded up like we saw a you can actually see see into the water like it has like variable transparency depending how deep it is it looks like yeah um they they, they keep tweaking the water i mean the water looked fantastic in that first trailer the basically non-functional trailer from e3 2015 and uh the the water just keeps getting more and more impressive it's quite needed too because now the water is actually playing a fundamental part of the game because as we saw you can now explore shipwrecks and um, you, you can drown in this game, and uh, so that's. I'm wondering if you will be able to suck air bubbles up like a uh, gloop from off of Banjo Kazooie, but uh, I doubt it. Uh, but uh, for somebody who probably ha- would have a fear of drowning if I swam more, um, it, it's kind of making me feel claustrophobic and a little anxiety riddle to think about swimming through i mean we knew eventually we were going to be swimming through shipwrecks that's that was alluded to as in as much as the um the cinematic trailer last year but uh it it was cool to see in action that that would be a great hook for a pirate game you're a you're a crew of pirates who can't swim (laughs) be the pirate you want to be that's their mantra what if my pirate doesn't swim um but uh yeah that, that was that was cool to see that and we also got a bit more um yeah, amazing DJ Dustin uh, said, uh, remember that uh, time when Heil said, shut up, Chad, I'm looking at the water. Ha ha, good times. They were good times. And uh, that was my proudest moment as a fake paid actor. 
Um, anyway, uh, one, one of the other things we had, um, it, it's, it's weird. I'm, my brain is like trying to juggle, like, am I allowed to talk about this? Am I not allowed to talk about this? I think Joe Neat said, we're basically allowed to talk about anything from the technical alpha now. We just can't share footage from it. But I'm still going to play it as safe as I possibly can while doing a podcast that's rare centric. Whew. Um, one of the things that was really uh, brought to the forefront with this trailer as well was lore, in-game lore. Um, because a lot of the tr- uh, gameplay trailers that we've seen up until this point have just been finding treasure, like going to sailing to islands, like rudimentary pirate stuff. We saw a little bit more of uh, magic this time around, um, some sort of like um, I don't know, comprehensive backstory that we might be able to suss out from these different islands. We saw this altar uh, with a boar skull on it, and this, this altar could be triggered well i guess we should point out that the rhymes that um greg males was uh alluding to on twitter are definitely for sea of thieves i told you guys i told you guys i don't want to uh you know blow smoke up my own ass but uh you know um I, i i am doing that and i'm doing it so much that santa claus could go down my mouth and it says it's serving as a chimney. Uh, but, yeah, Greg, of course, Greg Mails is still working on Sea of Thieves, guys. Come on. Uh, I, I will say I was happy to see the rhymes in this context because I love the idea that treasure hunting in this game can function like a sca- – it's basically a scavenger hunt with that sort of – you get a vague clue to go here instead of being just told to go directly here. And it also makes you feel like the Batman when the Riddler escapes Arkham Asylum. So uh, ev- everybody's favorite part of the Arkham games are the riddles, right? Right? No, these look cool. Uh, <laughs> because up until this point, it was just basically... Um, am I allowed to... Like, I, I don't even know what I'm allowed to say. Like, treasure hunting has been a lot more just f- X marks the spot. While this is uh, very much figuring out puzzles through studying the landscape. So it requires you to s- like pay attention to the world rather than just yeah. look at a map. And that will allow you to appreciate a lot of the details and the world building that Rare is creating for this archipelago. And uh, so, so basically you have to solve this riddle, figure out where this treasure is, and activate like th- these these treasure chests. And this is like an impressive treasure chest. This was what, like a legendary treasure chest. Uh, they called it in the trailer, um, but uh, th- it, it was triggered by a, a magical spell um, because the the boar head altar like lit up in like blue light, and uh, and then you get the treasure and skellies uh, appear to uh, like s- try to stop you, and uh, so that that was cool to see. I I always wondered if the skellies were going to be or some skellies were going to be tied to. Uh, you get a treasure chest, and then, boom, attacked by Skelly. So that was good to see that basically confirmed by the narration, if not so much the actual footage. Yeah, this is just your your Indiana Jones grabbing the idol moment, and it's really right. cool to see that. And again, going back to the, the treasure hunting and looking for details, this is something that, like, it goes back to what I loved about the quizzes in the Banjo games, and just, like, a, a, a lot of, like, males helm projects in the ever since banjo kazooie where you're just and well actually going back to uh donkey kong country 2 just rewarding the player for paying attention to the extra bits and bobs the team has put in yeah a- absolutely and the, like I, you know my viewpoint on this that you know i i I respect and appreciate that speed running. This is not a game you could ever speed run because it's just not built for that. It's not linear. It's 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 a community derived experience where the experience changes every time you play it. But um, I think that's why Sea of Thieves is so fundamentally appealing to me because it's not a game you can just blow through and then put on a shelf or trade in the GameStop. This is a game you live, and um, it's just so gratifying to see something so tailored for my sensibilities and i know like last year a lot of people were questioning my um 
abundant praise for the game because they thought, well, it's a multiplayer game that, and it's derived from like, like a lot of the like elements are derived from user-based experiences. Heil, that's not the kind of game you go for. You're a plot guy. But as you can see now, you know, I I couldn't talk about everything I knew last year and I still can't talk, but now we're seeing why I was so on board because yes, there is lore. There is more to this game world than meets the eye. And there is stuff that you can figure out, not just on your own, but with the team of people. And it, it's this is not a game that's going to spoon feed you exposition or, well, well, back in uh, 1612, this island was the site of, it's not going to do that. It's you're going to have to just kind of figure it out and guess. And there's going to be things that just remain a mystery. It's like the best of an open world sandbox experience where you find mysteries and stuff becomes a legend in your own mind. And it keeps you coming back, trying to figure out more and more details about the game world. Do you think we'll see like a four toed foot statue somewhere? <laughs> I, I would hope so. Yeah. Um, so we, we saw uh, the cr- uh, Kraken graffiti again. A lot of people thought we'd see the Kraken this time around, and I was on defense about it. I, I didn't know if they were going to blow their wad showing the Kraken. What? Second time I said blow the wad this episode. I apologize. I know this is being streamed in preschools across the country. I don't know what's wrong with me. Well, uh, this is a game with sailing. Maybe you need to say blow me down. Or or blow blow my semen. Semen. You know, semen. C- C- we are sorry. So anyway, uh, yeah, they they didn't show the Kraken, but they did show something I was really excited to see uh, in action, and that was firing your crew out of the cannons. This is something that um, a lot of people probably wondered would be possible at some point and those in the technical alpha probably just never probably gave up because once you get like in the rhythm of playing the game you're no longer like thinking you're like oh the cannons work like this and the fact that you can now uh, load yourself or crewmen in the cannon fire them you know onto an island or um, onto another crew ship as a saboteur, which sounds cool until you realize that when you see a ship on the horizon, a pirate can now fire themselves onto your ship. Now, granted, they'll probably miss, but it's still uh, adding a, a new terrifying element to the game. But uh, it, it was really cool to see. And it shows this is going to be a little bit more wacky and slapsticky and cartoony than a lot of people initially thought in 2015's reveal. Yeah, I think what appealed to me about it, this is something that, again, I would have gotten the impression this is a little bit too ridiculous for the kind of tone they've set so far, but I see it and I love the hell out of it. And I think this is one of those situations where is this going to be fun overrode the real-world logical think-through? And so... Is firing yourself through a cannon onto another ship fun? Yeah. Yes, I would think it will be. So then what do you care how much sense it makes? Yeah. Um, one of the things we talked about um, when I, um, at Rare was how they didn't want this to be a boring pirate simulator. This wasn't like the the movie Master and Commander of the Far Side of the World. Even they weren't pirates, but, you know, mariners. Uh, or this isn't like a Sid Meier game with pirates. This is fantasy pirates. This is the pirates that we all ha- romanticize and fantasize about. And yeah, it's going to be a little bit more slapsticky. And I mean, just look at the art style. The art style is basically a middle ground between something a little bit more harder edged and the art style grabbed by the Ghoulies. It's it's not it it's it's not supposed to look like these hyper-realistic games that preceded it and, and followed it at the briefing. This is this is a rare game. This is what people are seeing like human characters and they're getting their perception skewed. If this was a bunch of bears or other anthropomorphic animals, people, I think it would be clicking with a lot. A lot of the stubborn 
old school rare fans who still haven't gotten on board with Sea of Thieves. It's so weird to see so many people on the DK Vine forum, and it's your right, but it's so many people on the DK Vine forum being outwardly dismissive of the game and seeing so many people who never had any interest in rare getting excited about Sea of Thieves. And I'm I, I, I hate to see like this this weird I mean, this is we, – we need new blood in the community. We're not getting any younger. But I, I really would like to see those people who, like, really were disappointed by the buyout era realize that Sea of Thieves is such a rare game. And it's such a breakthrough of a rare title. Like I say, this is this is the third rare game that will – or at least has the potential to change – video games donkey kong country golden eye sea of thieves i'm i'm even seeing like people on my social media feed who i know from outside my rare rare fan circles freaking out about sea of thieves i even got to surprise some of them just recently telling them that hey you guys know about the insider program right and i almost never get to do that with anything we cover on dk vine so that is the amazing to see this game have the legs that it does and the appeal that it does yeah i mean i own about seven sea of thieves shirts and i wear them so when i'm out in public um sometimes i get recognized from the the trailer last year but other times people just see the shirt and they're like oh my god that's awesome where did you get that shirt and that's the kind of conversations that never even come up when i'm wearing something nintendo related like donkey kong related Sea of Thieves is going to be a big deal, whether you realize it or not. And like I said, this this wall between those in a technical alpha and those that haven't has has meant that conversation hype for it has been behind a curtain. You guys aren't seeing like what is happening, what is taking root, and I think it's going to creep up on a lot of people. Like, wait, Sea of Thieves is a big deal? What? But but what? But rare is dead. Nobody cares about rare people will care about rare again they already are caring about rare again because of sea of thieves and the the, it it, it's really a modern rare game they're not trying to harken back it's not just a nostalgia cash grab it is taking the rare sensibilities and propelling them into 2017 or should i say early 2018 because that is the tentative confirmed release date now we have finally for sea of thieves early 2018 which as we, we were talking at dinner last night, could basically mean from January 1st to June 30th. I mean, June 29th, because like, June 30th is pushing it as far as early 2018. But it, it could be sometime in the first six months. I really hope it gets a summer release or release closer to summer. Well, I don't know, because then it's close to E3 time, and I'm just scrambling to get work done for the DK Vine. I just hope it comes out when they're satisfied with it. Um, This looks like a seriously ambitious game, and I want them to have the time to devote to what they want to put into it. Not me. I demand it released when I say it's released. Uh, It would be be really cool if it got a summer release because it is like the quintessential summer game. Um, And, I mean, granted, it's fun to play year-round, but... The, the whole notion of sailing the ocean, exploring tropical islands, being a pirate, that, that would be great. June through August. Oh, excuse me. June through September 20-something because that's when summer officially ends. And don't tell me otherwise, department stores. I'm not going to buy a jack-o'-lantern when it's still summer. Anyway, uh, so, yeah, Sea of Thieves, it, it looked fun. It looked, I mean, look, Cameron and I are already in the bag for this game, so we're just kind of... This is a formality. We're going to get it, and we're going to play it. And what we're going to be talking a lot about Sea of Thieves from this point on in the conversation. I mean, we we still have to wrap up formal ukulele discussion. We have other odds and sods to get to, and we'll see what Nintendo's showing off tomorrow. But Sea of Thieves is going to become a big part of DK Vine, guys, whether you're ready for it or not. And I know a lot of you are like, well, you don't even, we don't even know if it's DKU yet. Just Sea of Thieves is going to be a big part of DK Vine. Trust me. And I, I, what I want to do for, your, for you is well, I'm not going to win over everybody. And it's not really my job to be a, a shill for this game. It, it's to be as unbiased as possible. But I have never been this excited about a video game since I was a kid. So 
I, I, I know it's like ethically blurred because I was in a trailer for it, but I was in a trailer for it because I was excited about it. I mean, it's, it's, I cannot properly articulate how amazing this game is. And everybody in the uh, technical alpha realizes that. So if you don't believe me, turn to them. Uh, turn to everybody on DK Vine who who is through that door and let them win you over. Uh, to the extent that they can without <laughs> violating a contract that they signed. Exactly. And, uh, you know, the great thing about DK Vine, though, is for, for all of you who are worried that you don't have anybody to play this game with, that is what the DK Vine forum is for. You'll, you'll meet people there and crew up with them. And, you know, trust me, I know co-op. I, I know a lot of us are set in our ways and we like single player experiences and we don't like playing with anybody else on anybody else's timetable. Give this game a shot because it will rewire your way of thinking. Co-op gaming, cooperative co-op gaming is so much fun. And Sea of Thieves is just an experience like none other. It's it's like the old two-player teams in Donkey Kong Country, if I, if, if I need to go to that reference. It, it's like that amplified um, by like a, a million. So, uh, yeah, Sea of Thieves. Uh, I guess we should talk about some other stuff real quick. Uh, the, the, the actual big news as far as uh, the media is concerned is the new... Uh, can we call it a new console? I don't really know. It's it's what we were calling Scorpio last year, which was a badass name. The new name is uh, the the Xbox One X, or uh, as its initial, the X O X, which you know, hugs and kisses. Thank you, Phil Spencer. Yeah. Um, yeah, I have no comment on this. I. Uh... Uh, I, I feel like this is going to have to be a wait-and-see thing for me. I really don't know how this is going to go over. Um, the name is... It's it's okay. I feel like it may lead into the same kind of issue the Wii U had. Um, maybe not to the same extent, because this is kind of... The Wii U name convention, the problem with that was it did sound like an in-between step console when it was, in fact, a leap forward. This is kind of this is kind of a have your cake and eat it too situation. Um, and watching the presentation, I I wonder if you feel this way, Heil. Um, e- even if I'm still, I, I I'm not like down on the Xbox One X. And God, that uh, God, that is awkward to say um, right now. I nearly said Scorpio because I've been like everyone else making Simpsons references about it. Right, and I, I want because of the Scorpio name, I want to call it the Xbox One S. But that's something else. <laughs> and uh, it, I, I'm just saying, it, it, it would have been a good time to the the branding synergy would have been perfect to uh re, to uh get a Jet Force Scorpio in development. <laughs> um, but uh, I, I'm curious if you feel this way, Hal. Do you feel like you learned anything other than the name about the Xbox One X? That you didn't know last year, and I—I I, I mean, yes, there's the price too, but uh, what's the price, Cameron? What was it? Four? Was it four ninety nine? Four ninety nine, not five hundred. Don't worry, it's not—it's not that much. It's four ninety nine. Oh, good. It—it it won't break the bank then. Uh, I, I didn't really learn anything about it's four K. Uh, I mean, it's 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 powerful. But it's also compatible with the other Xbox One family consoles. Quite honestly, I, I it's going to be have to wait and see purchase for me. Like I want to experience Sea of Thieves the best I can, but Sea of Thieves is already an amazing experience on the just standard Xbox One. That I mean, if, if, I I can't afford that right now. I still haven't even bought a Switch, so it's going to have to be like one of these wait and see what my life situation is when it comes out and if it's something that really is, is justified. Um, I, I, I mean, for, from the sounds of it, like it's, they're, they're, they're kind of um, selling it as like, you'll never need another Xbox 
console again, which cannot be true. I, I, I remember the, some of the hype for the Nintendo 64 when it came out that because of the expand the, the eventual expansion pack and because of the 64 DD, the, the Nintendo 64 would just keep getting more and more powerful. Nintendo would never have to do another console. The Nintendo 64 was it, man. And uh, that was just laughable. But th- it, when you're naive and young, and that was a great selling point, too, to get my parents to lend me enough money to buy it. It's like, I'll never need to, un- to buy another console again. This is it. And uh, you're like a little politician when you're that age and you're trying to uh, win over your parents to make a, a pretty substantial financial uh, down payment on a hunk of plastic. Uh, so, yeah, but I I really don't have a lot of concrete thoughts about the Xbox One X, except the name is hilariously awkward and... Uh, you know, but I have enough faith in uh, Phil Spencer and the direction of uh, Microsoft Studios right now that, um, yeah, I- I'm going to wait and see. I'm not going to be a cynical dickhole about this like I would have been uh, five years ago. And you know what? I, I might-, might buy it. I-, I, have to- I have to see how substantial the upgrade re- truly is. I mean, I-, I think all the games showed off were showed off on... Uh, I almost said Scorpio, but it, where they all showed off the ones that were compatible on Xbox One X, were they all running, or is that just hype, or is that just a misnomer on my part? Um, at, at least as far as I understand it, I think the ones that they advertised as running on Xbox One X were, in fact, running on there. I mean, at least I get that impression from the fact that the Sea of Thieves trailer was uploaded in resolutions higher than uh, our actual uh, laptop and tablet devices we're using here, and therefore it runs in a higher resolution than our televisions at the moment, because uh, I don't think either one of us has a personal 4K TV. No. At the ver- and that's going to be another thing that's kind of interesting. I when I when I look at this, I kind of wonder if this is going to be. A situation like a like this is something that I would see in the history of the things that Sega would do when they're in the console industry, where they would hit on these ideas that were ludicrously ahead of their time. Like a like the Genesis had a downloadable video game service um, back when you had dial up if you were lucky, um, and several things from there and some early internet things they were toying with with the Dreamcast, like some of the first DLC, and just things that were a little bit, I think, too ahead of the curb to wow the general public because they hadn't quite caught up yet. And I'm wondering if maybe by the time the Xbox One X comes out, things will progress a little bit more like a... I'd say the example of this sort of development hitting at just the right time was uh, Sony launching the PS2 with the DVD... um, compatibility um so that you you would appeal to these people who the dvd was the hot new thing in general homes like how i I imagine they're expecting 4k tv to be and that was an an aspect that really helped sell the console yeah definitely and that's really what hurt nintendo i think too uh refusing to play along uh with any of that and just say well we're just a video game company you know we're just it made it seem less like uh, an essential piece of your home entertainment setup and more just like an expensive toy. I, re- I even remember like that being like the def- like the PR defense, like Nintendo Power went back into the day like this. We our system doesn't support DVDs because we have our priorities in line and we're putting <laughs> gaming first. <laughs> yeah, yeah, that didn't really win out as an argument in the end. Uh, anyway, so yeah, Xbox One X, maybe my thoughts will, will evolve on it, or I'll actually have thoughts on it, uh, as E3 progresses. It's still so vague and nebulous to me that I'm, I'm just like, all right, I'm a layman. Can you see, I feel like, and it's something they did with the Scorpio T's last year too. They went into it at like, assuming that the audience already knew like the rumors and speculation about this. Can, can we talk about the t-shirt? I'll let you talk about the t-shirt, sure. Um, yeah, so there was a 
it, let me let me just pull it up because I do not want to get this uh, this verbiage wrong. I mean, this is another thing that the internet has kind of done its uh, diligence in creating a meme and driving it uh, straight into the ground before anybody has processed it. Um. <laughs> yeah, bear bear with me, folks. Uh. Okay, I'll I'll just paraphrase because I can't pull up the link. This is this is good pod right here. Um, yeah, I, I witnessed the the most powerful console launch ever, or something like that. Uh, yeah, yeah. It sounds filthy for some reason, and I can't quite like ascertain why. But it's also just something so shameless that I could never feel like I I could wear it in good conscience. So, uh, yeah, um, yeah. Uh, there, there's a there's a discussion right now in our t- uh, Twitch chat about um, the PS3 had a Blu-ray player. Um, yeah, I witnessed the most powerful console ever. That's just so... It, it seems like it should be followed by a line that says, and all I got was this lousy t-shirt. Right. Um, anyway, they're, they're talking about, well, the PS3 had a Blu-ray player, but Blu-ray has never, has never really caught on except with cinemaphiles and people who like care about a, a home theater setup. Uh, really, people like who don't really care about that level of quality and maybe they're going to start caring but i think blu-ray came too soon and it was just kind of this weird middle ground as everything started to shift to digital downloads and streaming and it 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 became this expensive outlier rather than the next step of the evolution of home entertainment so i mean granted i i i have a blu-ray player i i mean i have an xbox one obviously but i also have just a standalone blu-ray player I have Blu-rays for stuff I really want to own physical copies of, but Blu-ray, yeah, it's not like I'm running out and buying everything on Blu-ray. Nor am I buying any like any disc uh, for for movies anyway. You know, it's it's all digital now. Yeah, if, if I do buy a movie nowadays, I do tend to buy it on Blu-ray. But at the time, I don't think it was quite a big deal as the DVD compatibility was. For one thing. As I said, it wasn't as notable of a leap, but also it wasn't quite at the point where they were uh, the it was cost effective to ma- uh, manufacture that hardware. And I do remember how much of a joke the PS3's price tag was when it came out. Yeah. Uh, another issue is I don't think a lot of people had um, like when Blu-ray came out, HD TVs while they were the norm. It's it still wasn't necessarily in every home. Come to think of it, when they when they announced that console, I don't even think like Blu-ray had officially won the the HD DVD uh, Blu-ray battle, as uh, brief as it was, that uh, still lasted long enough to get a dedicated uh, Xbox peripheral for it. Right, right. Uh, I I for, for I mean before I even like. Uh, picked it i i, I was uh I, I i wanted a hd dvd or what what was it h it was hd dvd, HD DVD. i i kind of wanted them to win because i like the red pack gene over the blue but what do i know uh anyway uh so yeah well that that's a tangent uh <laughs> was there anything else from the conference that uh or the, the briefing that interested you uh well Something that briefly interested me until I realized it wasn't what I thought it was. <laughs> um, uh, uh, Super Lucky's tail, um, which uh, it, he's only got one tail. Uh, we thought at first it might have been twelve. <laughs> so ba- after the Sea of Thieves uh, presentation ended, I I was like spent. I was done. I so I like got up. I like started like just pacing because I can't sit still for too long. And uh, I, I looked over at the screen and I saw this this fluttering uh, reddish orange and white tail 
connected to a blue shirt. And I just started screaming, it's Conker! It's Conker! It's Conker! And uh, like people in the inner circle were getting excited too. And then he turned around and it wasn't Conker. It was Lucky. Was he a fox? I think think he, he's i think it's a fox or like a cat or something in that family but it was a it's an orange furry critter with a big bushy orange tail and a blue it's a, it's a cape it turns out but the way that we first saw it in the trailer was the character like running across the screen i think in kind of like a I think like kind of like on all fours, kind of like when Conquer would run in pocket tails or the twelve tails footage, and we even saw in this uh, in this footage um, things that again kept calling to mind like things we know from Conquer, like the the hole digging from uh, that we saw in trailers for Twelve Tails. Well, yeah, this looked like it was Twelve Tales repurposed for a a side scrolling game. There there was a book that like you jump into or or like you you went into for like the the context of I mean kind of, I don't know if like ukulele but 12 tales had the similar like book uh, menu aesthetic I had to wonder for a moment if there was something uh, agent ape wasn't uh, telling us the uh, uh, Andrew the gentleman who was uh, before uh, project spark uh, met its on timely demise uh, attempting to recreate uh, the entirety of conquer's pocket tales within it yeah yeah um because there was also a purple cat who resembled ko the cat a boss from 12 tales that never made it into bad fur day there was a grim reaper type enemy that looked like a more cartoony version of greg the grim reaper from bad fur day and i was like this looks like a fucking conquer game if if i squinted just a little bit, I, I would be convinced it was like the next iteration of Young Conquer. Just some other studio is just having a bizarre take on Conquer. Uh, Con- Conquer had a very awkward puberty. Yeah. Yeah. I, I, one of the jokes was is this fetal Conquer? What is this? Uh, so, no, it was uh, Lucky's Tale. Um, apparently, uh, DJ Dustin in the chat says Conquer was trending on Twitter because of Lucky's Tale. So, uh, <laughs> Just the piss poor character design. It looked like Tails, too, from Sonic. It, it looked like just this amalgamation of various woodland critter video game characters. The design was not super original, and I kind of hope they tweak it for their own sake because the comparisons are not going to stop anytime soon. Yeah, that's the thing. It like The game itself looked competent and kind of fun, um, but it's to- it's completely undermined by what we thought we were getting with it. Um, and to, to make things extra embarrassing, I think like it came out later, like this was off our radar. I think this is a game for the Oculus Rift that they've like refitted for uh, the Xbox One or or X. Uh, I, I don't know. Is this... Uh, I, I've seen, is, I've even seen like the like jokes, like uh, the Mega Man jokes about this X that they've appended to the end of the console. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> um yeah, also it's it it could it could be read as the Xbox 110. So, you know, go with Roman numerals. Yeah. yeah. Because because it already made enough sense going from 360 to 1 <laughs> to And now it now it's it's 110. So is that 11 or uh anyway, uh uh, anything else from uh, th- there were a couple cool games that I don't really remember now. Th- there was one game that looked like it was it started off post apocalyptic and then it ca- went into this Blade Runner type situation, which we thought was cool at the time. Uh, but now there's a lot of controversy attached to it. I don't know if we need to get into that. Yeah, I would just say it kind of it soured me on like uh, reading about this controversy because. I I love the heck out of the, it's like a weak spot for me. I love the heck out of cyberpunk like bad future e kind of things. I mean, like we said we were I think we were really on edging away from post-apocalyptic future. I I feel like the kind of speculative future I enjoy is like look, you can have terrible things happening, but at least give me cool shit. Um give me cool technical shit. And I think the things surrounding this game kind of brought me back down 
but but Cameron, it, it's it's a future brought about when progressivism run amok. Um, clearly, that's the kind of game that just sounds like a good time for everybody. Oh God, damn it! Uh, so there there was that Will of the Wisp game that I mean it it didn't really appeal. The art style appealed to me, but it seemed a little too maudlin at the end for my taste. It, it seemed like it was trying to make me cry at, for, during this trailer. I felt really bad during the the trailer for the Ori sequel, which that's another thing we with it, its sad bird and piano music. That's another thing that was an odd trend in this uh, Microsoft presentation. I don't know if you clued into it, how, but uh, birds were a very big thing. Lots, lots of birds. Lots of birds and deserts. The desert was the go-to location for most of these games. And then you, you would have the, uh, the, the was it a, the Assassin's Creed game that had the, the falcon yeah, the and the de- bird, I think. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, the, the Assassin's Creed Origins that takes place in Egypt. Okay. I mean, it's a money-making franchise that had a wonderful movie starring Michael Fassbender. So, uh, anyway, uh, what what else? I I don't know. I, I I can't think of anything else from the the conference itself that really like spoke to me. It got me like energized. I mean, so, like I said, it's once Sea of Thieves uh, ended its uh, seventy-two hour uh, trailer, uh, I was kind of done. Um, and then uh, from there, we uh, packed up, we drove to the uh, L.A. Convention Center and got our E3 badges. Which I would say, I I knew nothing about what this E3 experience was going to be like, particularly since uh, this is the first year in a while it's been open to the public again. I didn't know if we would be waiting in a several hours long line just to get in, but it was managed pretty eff- efficiently. Um, I maybe... I maybe stood in line for under 10 minutes. Yeah, I had to go up uh, inside to get my uh, media badge uh, because DK Vine is official media. And uh, that that was pretty quick, um, even though like they they have it like hidden. So uh, the only reason I knew where it was was I was the same last last year. Uh, and then we, we met up with uh, Chad, uh, who's out here, and we met up with uh, Dan from Killer Instinct Central, and eventually Mitchell Wolf, and we all had dinner together at a uh, uh, a Mexican restaurant that uh, I think I pissed off the waitress numerous times because of just my usual charming self. Uh, while, while we were having dinner with uh, Chad, the, the conversation of Minecraft came up, and one of the big reveals at the conference was that uh, Minecraft, you, you can now play um, like all, all versions of Minecraft on all platforms were now compatible with each other, but Chad explained to us that no, that's not actually the case. Yeah, I, I still don't quite understand this, um, which um, consoles are part of this crossplay scheme. I think, like, the glaring one that was ruled out was uh, Sony's platforms. Um, apparently, they didn't want to play ball. Um, I had kind of doubted that Switch compatibility would be part of this because it was... I remember it being a big thing that the, the Wii U version of Minecraft had to be pared down in its draw distance and overall world scale. But I, I have seen reports that, it, yeah, the Switch might be part of this. Um, and I think that was something they kind of kept deliberately vague in the presentation itself. Like, they just said consoles, PC... And I believe Xbox One, like, I think it was an intentional, vague thing, so they didn't have to explain this, uh, like, nightmare on stage of, you know, keeping it simple. Yes, it's available everywhere except for where the companies wouldn't play ball. And, and it's not available in the Java version either. Huh. Huh. You, you see, this is how ignorant I am of the site that I work for. You mentioned Java, and I just kind of my eyes go wide. Like I've, well, I, you're speaking a different language. I'm, I'm talking, of course, about uh, all Mister Coffee machines uh, that play Minecraft it will not be compatible. Uh, and then there is a new lighting mode. Uh, I, I called it the Donkey Kong 64 uh, corridor lighting effects, where it's just like overly like. A dramatic ambitious lighting that looks cool but uh it might be a bit much 
I, I had, was of a mixed mind about this. Like, uh, I mean, my again, my inner cynic bleeding through. Um, when I looked at this, I the the go to thing in my mind was all of these PC gaming mods that tend to crop up for popular titles where people mess around with the lighting engine, and sometimes it gets to be a really cool effect or something that's sort of Im- improving upon the official release and other times it just looks like uh like blur and bloom and this kind of like artificial enhancement of a game that doesn't quite gel with its existing art direction and i kind of felt like that was part of it um but on on the other hand it is technically impressive and i think chad brought up this point when i was kind of making this case uh, over dinner is that you do have to realize Minecraft is quite a few years old now at this point, um, especially if you factor in how long it was in its beta phase. Um, and uh, even for a game that is deliberately low spec, um, it, it it is showing its age a little bit. And these, these um, visual uh, enhancements do appeal to the audience and, he did helpfully point out that these will be toggleable features you can turn on and off if you don't really care for the lighting, which, I mean, I'm all for as many options as you can pack in. Um, something that might be relevant to our um, sites in our workings and something I was excited to see because I've enjoyed this on the PC version of Minecraft is uh, they had mentioned customizable skins being available on all platforms. Um, and that comes into that might come into a, a greater discussion later, considering um, these uh, Minecraft skins previously they're the whole reason we talk about Minecraft on DK Vine because uh, back when the console versions of Minecraft didn't have uh, custom skinning, at least to the point of painting them in as you can in the PC versions. Um, we had this whole debate when they released uh, official Rare-themed skins. You had skins of, say, Banjo and Greg the Grim Reaper. Um, I think uh, some Jet Force Gemini characters. Like, uh, across the board, Rare franchises. And we had this internal debate. Um, do we treat this as Banjo? Or do we treat this as the main character of Minecraft, Steve? Or you? Or whoever? Just wearing a very uh, low resolution costume yeah and lee loveday thankfully went the bat for us and said nope it's actually banjo and conquer and whoever else so uh yeah but i still haven't gotten into minecraft quite honestly it's i mean we're, we're, we have the dk minecraft server uh it's still part of our patreon uh but i have jeff Odin running it because i know nothing yeah, if you back at a high enough tier to get into that my Minecraft server, I wholeheartedly recommend it. Even if you have no actual interest in playing Minecraft yourself, like just load it up once and take a look at what people have done in there. It will blow your mind. Two dollars, uh, two dollars a month. Yeah. Uh, anyway, uh, so yeah, uh, we had dinner. Uh, we uh, went our separate ways and. Uh, the only other thing I could think of that was really on our minds about the conference was uh, the Xbox, uh, the original Xbox games are now uh, yeah. co- backwards compatibility is opening up with that, which not a big deal for Grab by the Ghoulies considering there's a more polished version of that in Rare Replay, but I think the game that a lot of Rare aficionados are looking to, to towards now is Conquer Live and Reloaded. That version was not included in Rare Replay, and to have a working version with the online multiplayer would be a big deal. Yeah, Conquer uh, Live and Reloaded at the moment would probably be more accurately titled Conquer Reloaded, um, because the live servers for the original Xbox have been down for, I think it was like midway into the 360's life that they cut the service. Um, And I... I sincerely hope that uh, Live and Relo- Reloaded is part of this and that my my uh, my ideal is that they have the online multiplayer aspect intact. Um, I, I had not purchased an Xbox console myself until um, they uh, announced the pre-order bonus for uh, Nuts and Bolts was the original Banjo-Kazooie. Like, that was my 
breaking point <laughs> apparently was getting a game I had played before and uh, getting a, ga- a new banjo. I didn't partic- I didn't care if it was a vehicle game. I like vehicle games. Um, <laughs> but uh, I did not get a lot of time to spend with the online component of Conquer Live and Reloaded. And I knew that that was a shame because it was a, when Live and Reloaded came out, it was a big deal in DK Vine's community circles. You had people on the forum arranging these multiplayer matches and talking about them afterwards on this forum. And I feel like in this modern age where I can, I have literally anyone on D- DK Vine at my fingertips at any given time. This would be so much easier to coordinate, and I'd love to experience this with a new crowd, um, as opposed to when I had no idea what I was doing and the only people left playing were people who had been playing the game for years or who knew, like, every exploit in the game's uh, engine. Yeah, yeah. That it, I was intimidated by Live and Reloaded, and I never really took part of it uh, in those sessions back in the day. Uh, so it, it'll be nice now that I'm uh, no longer a virgin when it comes to online gaming uh, or Xbox Live that uh, I, I, I could go in and uh, participate in that orgy. The word orgy being on my mind, of course, because Scraps is in the uh, Twitch chat wondering why uh, the the five of us didn't participate in one after dinner. Uh, it's Quite honestly, Scraps, it's because we ate Mexican food, and nobody wants to do that after eating Mexican food. Uh, so, by the way, I, I, I will wrap up this episode because we really have to get going here um, by explaining why the waitress was upset with me. Because, uh, okay, so I asked for the vegetarian menu, and it said on the bottom of the menu, uh, ask for a vegetarian menu, and everything on this menu had meat. So I asked for it, and I think that was like strike one. Strike two is uh, when I get the menu and it, there's a, an, a quesadilla that, that says it's made with chihuahua cheese. And, and, okay, so I'm like, what the fuck is chihuahua cheese? And obviously, that's not what it sounds like. <laughs> so I asked, I, I was like, what is chihuahua cheese? And she's oh, it's just, it's just a white cheese. And I was like, okay, so you, you didn't milk a dog. So she spit in my food after that. She, she visibly did not appreciate that humor. <laughs> Look, I have to know, are they milking dogs in this restaurant or not, okay? I feel like it is a fundamental right as one of their patrons to know if they have extensive dog milking apparatuses in the kitchen. <sighs> well, I mean, if it's your duty as a patron to know that, maybe we should fully disclose. Um, we are, in fact, milking dogs as part of the DK Vine Patreon. Coming soon to our merch store, launching later this summer. All right, everybody. This was a lot of fun. We have to get going. Uh, Busy day, busy week ahead of us. Uh, Stay tuned to DK Vine for all E3 updates on Rare, on anything Donkey Kong-centric from Nintendo. Uh, We know New Donk City is going to have a presence, and we can maybe finally uh, figure out what that means for us. Uh, Stay tuned. We will be you know, uh, Facebook, Twitter, YouTube, and of course, we'll be back here on the conversation for Nintendo's reveals. I'm Heil Russell. I'm Cameron Regal. And party on, DK Vine. This has been a File 2 production. Qué rico.